to know. Fatal floods. Bangladesh is neck deep in torrents of water as the death toll from the submerged continues to see an uptick with close to 6 million drastically affected. Delicate diplomacy. UK Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer meets Germany's Olaf Scholz in Berlin as he aims to reset UK EU relations. Race to the finish. Both the Republican and Democratic camps put their best into campaigning in the key battleground states as polls continue to show no clear leader pulling ahead. And a dazzling finish. It's a curtain call at the World Tango Competition and the pinnacle of dancing talent take to the stage to go out with a band. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Derna, World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Well, a very good evening and thank you for tuning in on World News this Wednesday night. We have a very packed bulletin to bring you this evening and we begin in our region with updates on Bangladesh. The death toll from devastating floods caused by relentless monsoon rain and overflowing rivers in Bangladesh has risen with around 1.24 million families stranded across 11 districts. Well, as floodwaters receive slowly, many of the 5.7 million affected people remain isolated and in urgent need of food, clean water, medicine and dry clothes, above all in remote areas where block roads have 100 rescues and relief efforts. The Bangladesh Meteorological Department said that flood conditions could persist if the monsoon rains continued, as water levels were receding very slowly. Around 470,000 people have taken refuge in 3,500 shelters in the flood-hit districts, where around 650 medical teams are on the ground to provide treatment, with the Army, Air Force, Navy and the South Asian Country's Border Guard assisting in rescue and relief operations. Vast areas of land are submerged, posing a significant threat to crops if floodwaters linger for an extended period. In flood-affected regions close to the Indian border, many are blaming India, which they said released water from the Dombar Dam in the state of Tripura in the middle of last week. India has denied opening the Sluis Gates. Now over in Afghanistan, new Taliban rules further oppress women in the military-ruled country, banning them from public life and basic freedoms. Western governments remain unable to take concrete action against the Islamic fundamentalist group. It's the latest draconian measure to come out of Afghanistan. Three years after the return of the Taliban, new laws now prohibit Afghan women from showing their faces or even speaking outside their homes. Full face veils have become obligatory with makeup and perfume now banned. Since the Taliban's return, women have been practically erased from public view. Girls older than 12 have been banned from school, women have been restricted from numerous jobs, and beauty salons have been forced to close. The new laws will now likely push women and girls in Afghanistan to the brink. While rights groups say the new restrictive laws in Afghanistan are tantamount to gender apartheid, the reaction from the international community has been muted. There's some diplomatic updates for you now. Prime Minister Keir Starmer is in Germany as he aims to reset the UK's relationship with Europe. He's meeting German Chancellor Olaf Scholz before talks with the French President Emmanuel Macron. So Keir Starmer launches his great Brexit reset in Berlin this morning. It's where he'll meet with the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, seeking a new agreement that will cover areas such as energy security, technology and science. They'll also discuss joint efforts to tackle illegal migration by sharing intelligence on smuggling gangs. The Prime Minister ahead of the visit said, we've got a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reset our relationship with Europe and strive for genuine, ambitious partnerships that deliver for the British people. The government hopes the new treaty with Germany could be agreed within six months, and Sakir has vowed to forge a closer relationship with Europe. But Labour is also facing questions at home and a budget that is likely to see tax rises, and why party donor Lord Ali was given a pass to Downing Street. Despite these domestic challenges, the Prime Minister will be hoping that this trip to Berlin and later a meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris ahead of the Paralympics opening ceremony will manage to generate some positive headlines. 
In the Democratic Republic of Congo, 3.4% of the 16,700 recorded monkeypox cases have died. The government has announced a response and hopes to receive the first vaccine doses this week. But in the meantime, medical teams are tending to more and more infected people, particularly in the east of the country, the epicenter of the outbreak. In this tent at Kavumu Hospital in the province of South Kivu in eastern Congo, mothers gather, exhausted and worried. Inzigire watches over her four children, all of whom have been infected by MPOX. South Kivu is the epicenter of the MPOX epidemic in Congo, with over 5,000 cases detected in the province since January. In the neighboring province of North Kivu, MPOX cases are also multiplying. Patients are put into isolation and then treated. An average of 10 new cases arrive every day mainly children, from overcrowded displacement camps. To combat the epidemic, awareness campaigns have been launched in several displacement camps around the city of Goma. Health workers go over and over protective measures to take against infection, such as washing hands regularly and avoiding physical contact. But the measures are difficult to apply in these conditions. Here, the only hope is the arrival of MPOX vaccines. Israeli security forces say that they are carrying out a counter-terrorism operation in the north of the occupied West Bank. This appears to be a major Israeli operation with at least four Palestinian cities being targeted at the same time. Meanwhile, the military announced that its special forces had recovered an Israeli hostage from a tunnel in the southern Gaza. The Israeli army released video on Tuesday that it said showed Qaid Fahan al-Qadi, an Israeli hostage the military said was rescued from a tunnel in the southern Gaza Strip. Video showed a military helicopter landing at a hospital to receive the 52-year-old. Military spokesperson, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, said Al-Qadi was recovered in a complex rescue operation from an underground tunnel in southern Gaza. He gave no other details of the operation, citing the security of the remaining hostages and Israeli forces. The operation was hailed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who said he had spoken with Al-Qadi. He added that Israel would work tirelessly to return the more than 100 hostages still in Gaza back home. Ismail Al-Qadi, the brother of the rescued hostage, spoke to reporters outside the hospital. Al-Qadi was taken hostage in Kibbutz Megan, one of a string of communities around the Gaza Strip that was attacked by Hamas-led fighters on October 7th. More than 250 Israelis and foreigners were taken hostage in the attack, in which some 1,200 people were killed. Since then, Israel's military has leveled much of the Gaza Strip and displaced most of the 2.3 million population. And Palestinian health authorities say more than 40,000 people have been killed in Gaza by Israeli forces. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight, former U.S. President Donald Trump says he's agreed to hold a televised debate against Vice President Kamala Harris on the 10th of September in the same style as the one he had with President Joe Biden in the month of June. The last time former U.S. President Donald Trump took part in a televised debate was in June against U.S. President Joe Biden. With Biden struggling in that debate, Trump's chances of winning the November election rose. Months later, Trump has agreed to another televised debate. However, this time, he is looking at a completely different opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris. Taking to his social media platform, Truth Social, on Tuesday, Trump said he has agreed to take part in the televised debate, but under the condition that the rules are the same as those enforced in CNN's June debate. Reiterating the previous rules, Trump said the debate will be held with both candidates standing up without pre-written notes. He called for a fair and equitable debate with no questions being given in advance to either side. However, the Trump and Harris camps continued to argue over whether to allow the muting of microphones during the September debate. Trump's campaign insists that each candidate should have their microphones muted when it's not their turn to speak, as was the case in June. However, the Harris campaign believes that the microphones should be open throughout the debate to allow viewers to hear if Trump interrupts or talks over the vice president. The debate is scheduled to be held in Philadelphia and will be moderated by David Muir and Lindsey Davis. The September 10th debate was initially set to take place between Trump and Biden before the incumbent dropped out of the race. 
Well, it's officially 10 weeks until election day in the US on the 5th of November. And former President Trump is now working at breakneck speed as to aim blunt Vice President Harry's momentum as she rides a wave of energy and enthusiasm out of last week's Democratic National Convention. So for more updates on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Susan Shinali reading from Toronto in Canada. Shinali, what's the update? Yes, Vinod, Trump campaigns this week in Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, three of the seven battleground states from coast to coast that will likely determine the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. Meanwhile, Vice President Harris and her running mate, Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota, kick off a two-day bus tour this week in the crucial southeastern battleground of Georgia. Expect the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on the campaign trail to be repeated going forward until Election Day. But over the next month, there are also a handful of major markers that could impact the outcome of the election. Governor Greg Abbott announced that Texas has purged 1.1 million names from voting rolls since the 2020 presidential election after the state found them to be ineligible. Abbott signed Election Integrity Bill SB1 into law in 2021, requiring the Secretary of State to work with the Department of Public Safety to compare information on citizenship status in that agency's database to the voter rolls. The checks are required to be monthly. Over to you, Vinat. Thank you. And that was Adha Dhanavar News Special Correspondent Susan Shinali joining us from Toronto in Canada. Well, Donald Trump was hit with a new 36-page indictment related to his efforts to overturn his 2020 election defeat, focusing on his role as a political candidate, seeking reflection rather than as the president at the time. The new indictment was obtained by U.S. Special Counsel Jack Smith's team after narrowing their approach to the election subversion case, following a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that former presidents have broad immunity from criminal prosecution. The revised indictment lays out the same four charges it brought against Trump last year, but it focuses on his role as a political candidate seeking re-election, rather than as the president at the time. The new reworked indictment no longer includes allegations that Trump sought to pressure the U.S. Justice Department in his bid to overturn the election. Dropping those allegations appeared to be an effort to keep the prosecution alive after the Supreme Court found on July 1st that Trump could not be prosecuted for that conduct. A Justice Department spokesman said the case was presented to a new grand jury, which had not heard evidence from the original case. Attorneys for Trump did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says his country's incursion into Russia's Kursk region was a part of what he calls a victory plan. He also planning to present the idea to the United States President Joe Biden. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky revealed on Tuesday he has a plan he wants to present to US President Joe Biden, which he believes will end the war with Russia. One part of the plan that is already performed is in the Kursk region. The second part is Ukraine's strategic place in the world's security infrastructure. The third part is a pressure package, a powerful package to force Russia to end the war diplomatically. The fourth part is economic. He said it would eventually end in dialogue, but that Kyiv had to be in a strong position. There was no indication of what the next steps would be, but he said he was hoping to attend the UN General Assembly in New York in September and that he was preparing to meet Biden. The comments come as several people are dead and multiple injured after Russia continued major missile and drone attacks across Ukraine regions for a second day, officials said on Tuesday. Two people were killed when this hotel was hit by a missile in the central city of Krivi Ria. Just the frame of the building remained as rescuers combed through the rubble. In the southeastern city of Zaporizhia, three died in a drone attack with three others injured in the region. The strike comes a day after Russia pummeled Ukrainian energy infrastructure with more than 200 missiles and drones on Monday in its biggest air attack of the war. 
While Tuesday's barrage was smaller, in the capital Kyiv, the military administration said air defences shot down all incoming targets aimed at the city. Zelensky said on Tuesday that Kyiv would retaliate against Russia for its strikes. He asked allies to consider joint air defence operations and provide long-range capabilities. The Russian Defence Ministry said forces had carried out a high-precision weapon strike on Ukraine overnight, the Interfax news agency reported. Moscow denies targeting civilians since launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, although thousands have been killed. Several Russian military bloggers said Moscow's attacks were an act of retaliation for Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russia's western Kursk region, the first such action since World War II. The UN nuclear watchdog chief Rafael Grossi said Russia's Kursk power plant is at risk of a nuclear accident which has been put under a spotlight after the recent incursion by Ukrainian forces. UN nuclear watchdog chief Rafael Grossi said Russia's Kursk power plant is at risk of a nuclear accident. That's while a frontline battle rages in the Kursk region, a mere 25 miles from the plant. Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, gave his warning on Tuesday after an inspection. President Vladimir Putin accused Ukraine last week of trying to attack the Kursk plant. That's after Ukrainian troops carved out a portion of Russian territory this month. Ukraine has yet to respond to the accusations that it attacked the facility. The safety of nuclear power plants has repeatedly been endangered over the course of the Ukraine war. Conflict began in February 2022, when Russia sent thousands of troops over the border into Ukraine. Moscow and Kyiv have repeatedly blamed each other for drone and artillery attacks on the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. However, the recent incursion by Ukrainian forces into Russia has put the spotlight on the Kursk plant. It has four reactors of the same design as those at the Chernobyl nuclear plant, scene of the world's worst civilian nuclear disaster in 1986. Grossi also visited a school in the region, close to the Kursk nuclear power plant. A reporter heard air raid sirens blaring, indicating a missile threat, moments before Grossi arrived. Grossi has repeatedly warned of a nuclear disaster if nuclear plants are attacked. The Paris Paralympics will begin with a spectacular opening ceremony in the city still on the high after highly successful Olympics. A new generation of Paralympians will join seasoned veterans competing in many of the same venues that hosted Olympic sports. At the foot of the obelisk at Place de la Concorde, a group of 150 dancers is rehearsing for the opening ceremony of the Paralympics. They're keeping step to music that was born from the sound of a drum. As with the opening ceremony for the Olympics, it's Victor Lemann who has composed the music. He explains that this time the theme is a bit different and that he used the recorded sounds of the athletes breathing. <sighs> Themes are also taking shape in the atelier, where costume makers are making final touches to their designs. The costumes were all custom made for the participants. Soon, these hand-sewn pieces will be under the lights and admired by 300 million TV viewers across the globe. The excitement is building for a historic ceremony, the first in the heart of the host city for a Paralympics. Once again, Paris is ready for the Olympic flame to burn bright. The cauldron will fly high above the City of Lights. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Every night in Buenos Aires, cozy clubs and cavernous halls filled with dancers from around the world who cling to one another in the embrace of Argentine tango, gliding in sync to pan tunes and nostalgia loss and love.
Tango Spotlight moved to the stage this week as several hundred competitors vied for the world's top titles at the annual Buenos Aires Tango Festival and competition, which was attended by 10,000 spectators on closing night. Argentina is revered as the world's mecca for tango music and dancing, both in social clubs and in the glitzy stage shows. The participants hailed from places as far as flung as Brazil, Colombia, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Russia, South Korea and United States and the Ukraine. But the top honours went to Argentinians. Well, with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. The Stereo Nest Sanumi Mudan Naika will join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.